So for the um, architecture of the Qin and Han dynasty, we focus on a different aspect of architectural history. We will talk more about the relationship between um, ritual activities, um, the concept of cosmology, um, and their relationship with architecture. The Qin and Han Dynasty, these are um, two very important uh, period in Chinese history. They can be viewed as one long period um, because the Qin Dynasty was very brief, um, only for um, the, the United Qin Dynasty is only for 15 years. Um, <clears throat> then followed by the Han Dynasty that lasted, um, if we neglect the, you know, the interruption of the Xin Dynasty in the middle, it lasted for more than 400 years. So it's basically from the 3rd century BCE to the 3rd century CE, um, you know, more than 400 years uh, in total. So the Qin Dynasty, <clears throat> even though the United Qin Dynasty or the Qin Empire is uh, brief, the history of the Qin state, however, um, is very long. So it developed from the um, earlier Qin state in the Zhou Dynasty. You know, in the Zhou Dynasty, there is a son of heaven uh, known as the son of heaven. This is the king of Zhou. In the Western Zhou period, there is only one king uh, for kind of entire known China. And that is the king of Zhou. They, um, you know, live in the Xi'an, the capital in modern day Xi'an. That is during the Western Zhou um, period. And then the rest of, of China was ruled by those local lords. And those local lords are in different ranks. Some of them are known as, as the dukes. Some of them are marquee uh, states. But they are, you know, semi-independent uh, kingdoms and ruling the um, different parts, different provinces of China while acknowledging that the king of Zhou was the uh, common, common lord, common, you know, ruler um, for entire China. So that was the, uh, the Western Zhou period. In the, during the Eastern Zhou period, after 770 BCE, situation starts to change. Those local laws became more and more independent. And uh, eventually some of them declare themselves king. So in the Eastern Zhou period, there are more than one king. There is a king of Zhou now living in Luoyang here instead of Xi'an. And then there are those local previous dukes and marquis uh, declare themselves kings. So in the Eastern Zhou period, China was more fragmented um, administratively uh, because those local laws are virtue, um, you know, states. They are basically independent states. And they also fight with one another, expanding their own controlled territories and trying to kind of a, to to be the leading um, ruler among those states. And most of those states in the Eastern Zhou period are more powerful than the King of Zhou, which were nominally still the son of heaven, the only son of heaven, holding the title of son of heaven. One of those states, 
the Qin state, who eventually kind of occupied the capital of Western Zhou Dynasty, and um, they made their capital in Xi'an, and the um, the capital for the Zhou Son of Heaven um, was in the eastern capital of Luoyang during the uh, during the later Zhou period. So that Qin state grew stronger and stronger because they are at the border um, area of those the Chinese civilization, and they constantly fought the neighboring barbarians. So those you know, nomadic tribes referred to as barbarians by, you know, or the Xirong, um, or Chinese, basically the Western barbarians. So the, their military power grew stronger and stronger because they were kind of constantly at war. And because they are located in the border area, they had space to expand. So eventually the Zhou state became bigger than any other states during the Eastern Zhou period. They start with a very small kingdom. The Zhou family was driven to the east because of the invasion of the barbarians, not because of the Qin people. Um, the invasion of the barbarians drove the Zhou son of heaven to the Eastern capital, but later, the Qin people came and the, um, they defeated those invading barbarians and they put their capital in the previous kind of royal house of the son of heaven. So that's basically the birth of the, the Qin state. It's right <coughs> at the uh, threshold of Western Zhou and Eastern Zhou period. So it was relatively a younger states compared to those states in the Chinese heartland, which were established in the very beginning of the Zhou dynasty in the 11th century. So the Qin state was relatively young, but they grow more powerful because of their size, because of their constant kind of military exercise fighting the non-Chinese speaking people. So during the Eastern Zhou period, their territory continued growing. And um, because of those kind of, uh, um, you know, the constant competition, um, <clears throat> the number of states reduced consistently from the seventh century to the third century, right? So those local states, uh, in the beginning of the Zhou dynasty, there were hundreds of them, hundreds of smaller states. Uh, by, by the um, um, eighth century, the number of states became a few dozens. And then by the fifth century, the fifth century, <clears throat> started a period known as the Warring States period, the number of Chinese states was reduced to just around 10, 10 of them, but they are much bigger than the previous states, right? And the Qin was one of those 12 states. Eventually, um, toward the end of the third century BCE, the Qin states defeated all the other states and unified China and founded the Qin Empire, right? So that's basically the story <coughs> about the birth of the Qin Dynasty. So even though the Qin Empire lasted only from 221 to 206, its history stretched back to the eighth century BCE. Uh, so it's part of the story of the, you know, spring and autumn and the warring states. Um, during the Eastern Zhou period. So the Qin Empire was significant because it is the, for the first time, China was actually unified under one regime, under one kind of imperial house. And the first emperor of Qin left a lasting legacy in Chinese history. 
he is the great unifier. He not only unified the territory, but also unified the language. So before the unification of Qin, there were many different languages and many different writing systems. So script in the state of Qi, for example, is different from the state, uh, the script from the state of, of, of Zhao. And, uh, but after the unification, the unification was done in 221 BCE, the first emperor imposed that all people under heaven need to write the same script. And that script was based on a script of the Qin state. So he unified the script, the Chinese script. He also unified the, the weight and the measure units. Again, before that, different states use different money, use different, um, different measurement. So the, uh, the qi um, foot is it's, it's different from the zhao foot. And the, you know, the qin pound is different from the, the chu pound. But, but after the unification, all those were unified. The currency, the measurement, the weight, and everything. <coughs> he even unified the road width. You know, all the road needed to have consistent width to allow the passing of a certain number of chariot, um, you know, based on, you know, the, the rank of those cities and, and the streets. So he's a great unifier. Um, in your readings, you have read, you know, his, about his tomb, um, his palaces, his tomb is um, one of the, you know, major example we are going to cover today. So Qin Empire, even though it is, it is short living, it is very significant. It unified and prepared um, for the unification for the Han Dynasty. Um, the Qin state was short living partially because of the uh, first emperor was too ambitious. Um, he was famous for the construction of the Great Wall. He was also famous for the construction of his own tomb. According to uh, Sima Qian, the great Han Dynasty historian, that, um, you know, 300 thousand people were enlisted for the construction of the Great Wall. And if you consider the population of China back then, um, that is an enormous number. Uh, you know, the entire population might be only like 20 million. Um, and then just hundreds of thousands were just working on one big architectural project. So he exhausted, exhausted the, um, um, the wealth and uh, manpower of the empire and the people suffered. Um, so there were rebellion, um, uprising all over the, um, the empire at, at the end of the uh, third century BCE. And um, from that chaos, the Han Dynasty was established and uh, the early Han rulers learned the lesson. They adopted a policy of a policy to rest um, with with the people to have an easy time, not to exhaust the manpower and cause um, uprising anymore. So Han Dynasty um, lasted much longer, lasted for four hundred years, but the foundation for unification was really paved by, you know, the, the Qin dynasty, especially by the first emperor. So the Qin Han period is significant because this is a period um, for which the foundation of Chinese civilization was, was founded. Um, especially in the form of Confucianism and Taoism. You know, both founders of 
the two major Chinese religions were living during the spring and autumn period of the Eastern Zhou dynasty. So Laozi, the, found, the founder of Taoism, and Confucius, the founder of Confucianism, were both philosophers, great teachers of the 5th century BCE China. So they live right at the threshold of the, uh, from the spring and autumn period to the warring state period. However, during the Zhou dynasty, Confucianism and Taoism were primarily philosophical thought. They are more philosophical than religious. It is during the Han dynasty that Confucianism and Taoism were develop, developed into more systematic religious, organized religious practice. So um, Han Dynasty Confucianism, uh, especially after the great first century BCE uh, philosopher um, whose name is Dong Zhongshu, after him, Confucianism was organized into a complicated uh, system that basically incorporate most um, philosophical concepts in ancient China. And um, Taoism, similarly, after the Han Dynasty, it was developed into a religious practice that um, aimed for achieving immortality, <clears throat> which is almost the opposite of the philosophical Taoism. But it also continues some of the um, concept of, you know, preaching dynasty Taoism, but evolving into a complicated um, kind of pantheon of deities and um, a series of kind of practice uh, to achieve immortality, to join those um, god and goddesses in, in heaven. So they became systematic. Uh, institutionalized. And they were also uh, sanctioned. Um, uh, they were also kind of a uh, kind of developed into a state religion. Um, Taoism in the beginning of the Han Dynasty and Confucianism eventually was established as the some kind of a national ideology, national religion. Um, after the first century BCE. We will look at <clears throat> the specific concepts and how they were um, embodied in architecture later. <clears throat> but these major concepts like Tao, um, which basically means the way, but in Confucianism and Taoism, In both Confucianism and Taoism, Tao refer to the way, but also refer to something like the, the fundamental truth, the fundamental truth of the universe, and um, um, or energy, fundamental essence of the universe. And the concept of yin and yang, the concept of the basic um, composition of the universe of, of the five elements, um, etc., um, was embodied in ritual architecture of the Qin and Han dynasty. All right, for example, just give you one example. These are the these are the um, the roof tile, the tile end um, in Chinese architecture, um, especially during the Han Dynasty. They are um, decorated with the five mythical animal for the cardinal directions. Um, the red, red bird or the phoenix, which is the symbol of the South. And um, um, in this one, um, let, let me see. 
Yeah, I think it's this one. This is a red bird or the phoenix for the south. And uh, this is this is a blue dragon um, for the east, the symbol of the east. And this is the uh, the the white tiger, the symbol of the west. And this is the um, black turtle, uh, the symbol of the north. So under this kind of systematic um religious confucianism and taoism those um <clears throat> different elements were paired up with different directions with different um different you know uh aligned with different colors and uh, virtues um etc and etc and um they were used on different sides of the roof. Um, for example, you know, this one must be decorating the tile end of the eastern slope of a, of a ritual architecture. And the, um, the south, west, the northern slope of the, of the roofs. So, <clears throat> you know, the um, um, concepts conceptual ideas and regarding the cosmic order were um, used for, to decorate building, to decorate architecture. Architecture became an expression of those abstract concept about um, cosmic order and their relationship of, with human sphere. And this is something we will, we will look into you know, our second major example of this lecture, right? So this is, these are some artifacts showing <coughs> um, Han Dynasty Confucianism and Taoism. Han Dynasty Confucianism as a religion highlight um, har harmonious relationship in the human society. Um, they especially highlight the uh, virtue of filial piety and the um the belief that filial piety is the um basic relationship the relationship between father and son or between the parents and the offsprings is the most basic relationship and they believe that this relationship this basic um human relationship can be used to analyze all relationships um, in the world. Um, so the gift filial piety, the basic relationship between father and son, a universal value. For example, the yin and the yang relationship is basically a father and a son relationship. One is dominating, another is kind of a submissive um, and um, same as the relationship between the ruler and the subjects, right? The ruler is like the father and the uh, subject is like the, the son. And the yin-yang relationship is, can also be um, used to analyze a, you know, a, a couple. So, the husband is like yang and the wife is like yin. So this kind of basic um, human relationship was given much greater universal value and it eventually became the foundation of, um, of Confucian kind of concept about harmony. According to Confucianism, harmony philosophically speaking, is not based on equality, it's based on the kind of this basic yin and yang relationship. Um, on one hand, the dominating side is more powerful, but they need to be protective, they need to be kind, they need to be benign, just like the ruler. On the other hand, the submissive part is more dormant, not as active, but on the other hand, it is 
being protected. It, it needs to be respectable, respectful, but on the other hand, if the, um, the young part is failed to perform its, its function, then the yin part has the right to, to overthrow it. So it's that kind of um, idea, idea about harmony, about an ideal society or ideal kingdom. Um, kind of can be compared to Plato's idea um, about justice, about, you know, about what is a ideal um, country, an uh, ideal kind of government, that kind of thinking. Um, around the same time, philosophers on the East and West are thinking about, you know, were thinking about the same question, how to achieve justice, how to achieve harmony, how to, you know, have the uh, kind of per permanent governance, uh, the idea of philosophical king. Um, <clears throat> So Confucianism, like in this um, carving, shows you know officials paying homage to 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 rulers and highlighting those kind of a human world relationship. <laughs> On the other hand, the Han Dynasty Taoism um, developed a system of fantastic creatures and associated with the immortal land. So Han Dynasty Taoism believe there are immortal lands on the eastern and western end of the world. Uh, they believe the eastern end of the universe is the um, three islands in East Sea. Um, that is in the east. And the western end of the universe is called the Mount Kunlun. So in both, in both places, there are immortals. So if one could reach those places and get the elixir and bring it back, um, people could, could um, become immortals and join the god and the goddesses um, in those immortal land. So they develop all kinds of ways to, to acquire those um, elixir. So some of them, you know, sailed East China Sea, trying to reach those immortal island to get those uh, immortal medicine. Some of them try to cultivate, um, to produce those elixirs by um, combining different herbs, by you know, melting stones, um, and some of them believe that if you you have the um, the dew um, and mix it with the the powder of jade, and you can make uh, those uh, you know medicine for immortality. Um, so huge sculpture, huge. Um, Human figures were created um, holding a plate to receive the dew um, from heaven. And, um, you know, those are known as the Cheng Lu Xian Ren, um, those huge sculptures. So those are part of the Han Dynasty kind of Taoist culture. And both emperors from the Qin Dynasty and Han Dynasty sent huge fleets to East China Sea trying to get get the elixir, um, but kind of they were sometimes um, cheated. You know, some Taoists um, came asking for enormous amount of money and resource and uh, supposed to go to the land of immortality, but never actually came back. And other Taoists, sometimes, you know, they, <clears throat> they made, um, supposed, they, supposedly immortal medicine, and some emperors um, had them, and uh, 
you know, died because some of those were, were poisonous um, instead of kind of immortal. And uh, there were also an, a third idea, not going to the end of the world to find elixir, not trying to make it on earth, but try to cultivate your inner immortal elixir by controlling your breath. Um, that eventually became a third kind of practice, uh, still quite popular in, in Taoism today. Um, it's like the concept, con concept of, of, of yoga, right? So you, you, through meditation, you are trying to make that uh, elixir uh, inside your, your, bo your body, uh, directly cultivate that uh, in your very body. So this kind of give you a sense of Han Dynasty. So it's a period of very compl complicated ideas. It is about um, real world concern, but it is also associated with a lot of uh, philosophical thought from the previous period. But somehow they were put together to serve, to serve the, um, the government, to serve the, um, the practice on, on this world. So this, this um, utensil from Han Dynasty is an incense burner, uh, kind of a sensor, right? So you can, you can burn those incense inside, but it is sculpted in the form of the three island on East China Sea, showing the big waves and the big um, island and peaks, and there are immortals um, there. So it's, it's a part of the... Um, the Taoist belief from the Han Dynasty. The construction of tomb um, had something about to do with the belief of achieving immortality. So for the emperors, um, you know, the belief, you know, even though you, if, if you cannot achieve immortality in this world, at least you can rule uh, in the same fashion in the next world. The first emperor's tomb <clears throat> is built like a city. It, it, it has walls and gates just like a living city. Um, so this is the, um, the plan of the mausoleum of the uh, first emperor, uh, Qin Shi Huang or Qin Shi Huangdi. So um, <clears throat> the first emperor ruled as an emperor from 221 to 210 BCE. Before that, he was the king of the Qin state. After 221, he was the emperor, the first emperor of, of China. So this is his, um, his tomb. It has this characteristic rectangular walled quarters. There's an outer wall, there's an inner wall. And his uh, gigantic uh, tomb is located in the southern part of the inner city. And then the northern part has accompanying burials. There were also the so-called pleasure palaces to mimic the living city of the emperor. So the tomb was constructed for the um, next life of the, you know, of the emperor after, after his death. Um, we will come back to the tomb itself, but I want to point out to the, um, the famous terracotta army of the first emperor, they are located to the east of the, um, of the tomb. So these are the, the place where the terracotta army were discovered. Um, they are buried underground, thousands of them. So presumably to protect, to be commanded by the emperor after, after death. So this is the appearance of the first emperor's tomb um, today. From outside, it is, it is, it looks almost like um, a, a hill, but as I mentioned, 
we know these were man-made um, kind of pyramidal structure because these earths were rammed. Um, they are layered and there were signs of construction. Um, they were not natural hills. Um, you know, from your reading, you understand that we used to think this is just a truncated pyramid in the form of a truncated pyramid after thousands of years of erosion, but recent archaeological discovery confirmed there were nine stepped um, platforms, nine stepped terrace walls constructed within and they were wrapped up by the rammed earth from outside. So the article detailed the reason for the belief of this construction of the first emperor's mausoleum as a gesture for unification. So he unified everything and he also used his own tomb to unify all the ceremonial traditions of the previous warring states. Um, so this is like the the symbol unification in the construction of imperial, imperial tomb. The size is grand and we know relatively little about what is inside, even though we know more, but still the tomb is not excavated yet. Um, but the uh, Han Dynasty historian Sima Tian left a detailed description of what is, is inside. He said that the first emperor construct a model of the entire universe inside his tomb with the, the ceiling were inlaid with precious stones, crystals and uh, gems uh, to mimic the constellation in sky. And on the ground of the, the tomb chamber, mercuries were used to mimic the lake, the sea, the ocean, and the rivers. And, uh, um, you know, there were models of the five sacred mountains um, and also, you know, the, all the nine provinces of, of China, et cetera, and et cetera. And then there were uh, whale fat burning to illuminate the interior for forever. And there were kind of mechanic arrows um, installed to control the entrance. So whoever tried to break into the tomb chamber would be shot and killed. So he described that. It sounds like, you know, there is an entire underground world buried there, um, but it is not um, excavated yet. So all those fantasies are still um, kind of still just, you know, our exercise of imagination based on that fantastic description. So if previously we still doubt whether Sima Tian's description is an exaggeration or is a reality. Now, after the discovery of the Terracotta Army, there was little doubt that about the scale and um, gra uh, grandeur of the first emperor's tomb because here on the east side, east, east periphery of the tomb, thousands of terracotta soldiers were discovered and they were dressed in uh, realistically as an army. So it seems like an entire legion was buried underground in the form of, of terracotta soldiers. They were of life size they used to hold real weapon and they were in different fighting combat format. <clears throat> they were also specialized in different kind of function. Some of them were archers. Some of them are uh, charioteers, um, etc. So if something this big and this realistic could be achieved, then there is no reason to not believe inside of the tomb, something more extraordinary should, um, should, should be there. Um, and I'll just show you some other discoveries. You know, the, there were also bronze chariots 
buried in the first emperor's tomb. They are very realistic. The wheels rotate and they can be taken apart. And the horses were very realistic as well. Now, if we compare this kind of Qin Dynasty um, sacrificial burial with the uh, Shang Dynasty sacrificial burial, we see the difference. In the Qin Dynasty, there was no human sacrifice. So we have those terracotta and bronze replacing those real human beings and real horses. While in the Shang Dynasty, those sacrifice, sacrifice pit, sacrificial pits, were buried with real horses and, and real um, charioteers. So um, there's a big um, improvement right, in, the, um, in the Qin Dynasty, um, regardless, regardless of the um, atrocity recorded um, in history about the unification. So um, these soldiers buried there um, to protect the tomb, as I mentioned, were specialized in different um, position, holding different weapons. <clears throat> these are replicas, not real human sacrifice anymore, like you know, 1500 before uh, in, the, in the Shang Dynasty. You know, we have these tombs of skeleton, but here we have the tomb of something that could be put in museum to, to be called art, right? That's a big, big improve, improve, improvement. Show you the plan of the Terracotta Army. So far, four, four major pits had been discovered, um, and they were also mimicking architecture, dividing the internal space into bays, and those bays were filled with those Terracotta soldiers. They were also oriented quite well toward the cardinal direction, right? This rectangle are, you know, oriented toward the cardinal, cardinal directions. And this is a detailed <coughs> drawing of pit number two, just this pit, showing the division into bays and those, each of those little dot is a a soldier or a, a horse and a chariot, all kind of sculpted in terracotta sculpture. So, um, so we, we should um, look forward and expect, you know, one day when the uh, tomb was, was excavated, then um, it, it, it should uh, yield something that is quite um, extraordinary. You know, if something surrounding the tomb is this big and of this kind of grandness, then what is directly inside that, you know, artificial mountain there should be even greater, right? So I'm going to give you um, five minutes break. <clears throat>